Good morning, Fuller. How are you today? Good to see you this morning. Hey, can we worship the Lord today? We're going to start off our wonderful time together celebrating Jesus and who he is. So I invite you all to stand with me. And we're going to sing a song inviting you to the Say, all right, let's go.
Fantastic beginning to our 2019 Festival of Beginnings. Welcome, everyone. We are delighted that you're here in this worship service. I bring to you the peace of Christ be with you. Let us open our hearts as we invite the Spirit of the Lord who is already here with us. God, your goodness is always parading past us. We have only to look out for it. You're always being gracious to us. We only have to realize it. You're always being merciful to us. We only have to internalize it. You cover us with your hands and show us your glory as much as we can handle. If only we would attune ourselves to you. We don't direct the flow of your grace and mercy, but you do. We don't decide who gets what, but you do. You show no deference to anyone. You do not regard partiality in us people. Though we don't know you, you call us by name. Though we don't know you, there is no one else but you. We therefore set our minds toward knowing you, O Lord. We open the spaces of our hearts to you, O Lord. We set our bodies in stillness that we might hear from you, O Lord. We open our spirits to meeting with you, O Lord. You're always gracious to appear, surprising us with your beauty. And all God's people said, Amen. Beautiful Jesus. Oh 
give you all the glory and honor and praise this morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hear this reading reading from from Psalm 8. 8. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glories above heaven. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, that you have established. What are human beings that you are even mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. morning. It's a wonderful, wonderful wonderful gift and privilege to be able to have this time together this morning to worship God together and to begin the year in union and in unity together as a community. The text that we're going to speak about for a few minutes this morning is this rich text in Psalm 8, which I have to say for me is one of those hallmark texts that has a capacity to hold, I think, the sum of the whole enterprise of reality, in fact. I think it also holds the whole enterprise, therefore, certainly of Fuller Theological Seminary, not least the reality of the year that is before us. The psalm begins really with the stage in a certain way implied, having been set, as we might imagine, the writer being out under a clear Middle Eastern sky and taking in all that could be seen. Undoubtedly, even at that time, no doubt in a context and time when we still had dark skies, it was still possible to see more and more and more of the universe with the naked eye. There was certainly a sense of vastness and scope and sweep which the psalmist captures, and and a sense really that this first movement of the psalm is really a movement of awe. It's a movement of wonder. It's interesting that right from the beginning, however, the psalmist doesn't come simply to the empty universe, to simply the cosmos. But standing before the cosmos addresses the God of the cosmos, who is greater than even the cosmos itself. However, the psalmist might have imagined the enormity of the universe. It wouldn't have come close to our struggling capacity to imagine even today as astronomers tell us that there may be as many as two trillion galaxies. That would have been not only unimaginable, it is unimaginable. It is incomprehensible. And there's a sense that somehow the God that the psalmist is addressing, the God called by the name Yahweh, the covenant name of God, the promise-making, promise-keeping God, is a God who holds all of this in its vastness. However great the psalmist may have seen it at their time or however great we might now imagine it in ours, there's a sense that the God who he is addressing is even greater, even more sufficient than could even be imagined. The promise-making and promise-keeping God of Israel is the God whose name is evoked at the start of the psalm. And then the name Adonai, simply a reference in a way to the God of majesty, a God who reigns, a God who is not only the covenant-making God, but the God who reigns over all things in majesty. And that majesty is greater than even the majesty of the created universe. So there's this amazing sense that creation, which is so spontaneously combustible in the passion and awe, ultimately, of the psalmist, is exceeded by the God that the psalmist names. Swept up in that vision, 
the psalmist says, you have set your glory, your reality, your power, your character, your fullness above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. The universe is not empty. It's created and fashioned by a God of promises and of love and of faithfulness. And the universe is, is also not neutral. It's a place that has something that could be meaningfully referred to as enemies and avengers. There is in this universe real danger. There are significant challenges. There are, is real violence that is done to people. And interestingly, in the imagery of the psalmist trying to intensify the language, first with this sweep of the heavens, and then this distillation of all of that power and majesty also being held in the mouths of babies. Now, we had two babies, and they had significant mouths and had the capacity to evoke significant sound. I didn't always find that it was a spontaneous call to worship when I would hear their sounds, but sometimes it absolutely was, and regularly it was for me an experience of realizing the mystery, the absolute astounding mystery of this little tiny baby whose life held really all of the biological capacities that that child was going to have. Every cell with what we now would think of as 23 paired chromosomes, this amazing sense of the physicality of this small, minute baby. In the terms of the psalmist, it was to point to the most extreme reach of the heavens and the most profound intimacy and identity of each and every human being, even babies themselves. It's an, a remarkable, sweeping picture. This morning, I want it to, call, to be a frame that calls us in the course of this year and all of the work that we're going to do to place our work first and foremost in the context of awe. There is nothing that we're going to tackle intellectually, academically. There's nothing that we're going to grapple with theologically, culturally, or psychologically. There is nothing that we're going to think about sociologically or politically or economically. There's nothing that's going to happen relationally, which is not inside the reality of the God who is named here at the opening of this psalm. The greatness of this God in his glory and in his intimacy is a God who holds all the reality of the universe and the significance of each of our lives and all of our work. The psalmist, I think, here is really giving a very clear indication of what we find throughout the Psalter and in an even greater way throughout the whole of the Bible. This portrait of letting life, as we who were together last week in the Welcome Week service, thought about in Psalm 1, to live life in the context of a God-drenched vision of the universe in which God's presence and God's mercy and God's power and God's justice and God's grace is offered and given to us in all of the details of our lives. Some are at this moment, at the beginning of this academic year, trembling over the challenge of engaging a new topic, a new field, a new year of academic challenges. Administratively, Fuller faces a whole variety of challenges which can easily seem to be very, very daunting. We can think about the academic work that we're going to do, the publishing that needs to be done, the hard, careful, intellectual, and spiritual work that needs to occur. And in the context of all of that, again, the psalmist says, the God that he's naming here is a God who holds all of that, who is with us and for us in this enterprise. And interestingly, not a God who is unknown, whose name, albeit as Israel practiced it, unspoken and changed in order to honor the holiness of God, but nevertheless a name given as a way of saying this is the God who is the promise-making and promise-keeping God who holds the universe, including you and all of your people. It's a remarkable opening. God, the psalmist says, is one worthy of paying attention to. And then the second movement of the psalm really is even more dramatic in a way. It's suddenly as though looking into a mirror, the psalmist realizes that the, that the image that they were looking at is actually looking back. That this God who is described in such extraordinary terms is now the God, he says. When I look at your heavens, and the work of your fingers, and the moon and the stars that you have established, you could imagine him saying, I was dumbstruck. But what he says is even more personal and profound. What are human beings 
that you are mindful of them, that you consider them, that you think about them, that you pay attention to them. Mortals, that you care for them. It's an extraordinary way of moving from the vastness of the universe to the psalmist's own shock that if the God that we worship is a God who holds all of that reality, how could it possibly be that that God who now holds, we would say, two trillion galaxies, that the God of two trillion galaxies knows you and me and cares for us? This second movement of the psalm is really, to me, the thing that grounds our humanity, our clear sense of our human dignity, the, the stunning value and worth of each person, that the God who's made everything has also, in this language of Psalm 139, knit us together in our mother's wombs. A portrait of a God who, who gives us not just cellular life, but dignity, value, humanity, Think of all the disciplines that are going to be studied in Fuller this year. If we just take our three representative schools, think of all the disciplines within the School of Theology or that are touched on in the School of Intercultural Studies or that are explored in the School of Psychology. All of that is there to be done and is done by us, whether consciously always or not, as an exercise of human dignity, creatures made in the image of God. Why is it worth Lisette Rojas Flores doing research on the trauma of immigrant children? Because those children are made in the image of God, because they are bearers of the wonder and dignity of a creature as vulnerable as that and as profound as that. Why do we care at Fuller about issues for us of inclusion and equity because every human being made in the image of God is a person who carries this extraordinary image of the divine being who has fashioned and made us. As Lewis said, there is no such thing as a mere mortal because of the dignity and value of every life. Why does Fuller engage in places that from Los Angeles we would call far flung, but from Mozambique, Los Angeles is far flung. So in a far flung to far flung universe and globe, why do we pay attention to such distant places and concerns and issues? Why would we go to such lengths to try to create a curriculum which needs to reflect the diversity of human experience, of racial backgrounds, of social and political locations? Why do those things matter? Because in all of those places are human beings made in the image of God, bearing the dignity of a God who has fashioned each one. And that God, the Bible says, with focused attention, is mindful of us, pays attention to us. And if the exercise of our disciplines and the exercise of our scholarship and the work of our formation spiritually and theologically and pastorally is, amount, is to amount to anything, it has to be grounded really in this vision, this theological vision of the God that the psalmist gives us here, which translates into a very personal vision of how that God who holds all things also holds all of us and each of us in all of our dimensions. And that God is, is the God, God who says, says, now, I give you to each other. It is a remarkable thing to consider all of the reasons why a marriage and family program matters at a school like this, because we believe that the relationships matter. Why would it be instinctive to Fuller to have a psych school? Because, in fact, the interior life of our humanity and the relational life of our humanity matters in every way to the God who has fashioned us to be relational beings. Why does it matter that we would study culture? Because culture is a product and expression and embodiment of what it means to be human. And it manifests itself in an extraordinary variety of ways. And there is no global normativity of a singular culture or a singular race or a singular social identity, which is really the human. It manifests itself in countless ways across the world and in every kind of context holds the full dignity and value of God. Why do I need to speak louder when the helicopter flies over my head? Because I am a mere mortal. I am finite. And then in the last section of the psalm, perhaps one of the weightiest parts of the whole text is this. 
You have made us a little lower than God and crowned us with glory and honor. You have given us dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under your feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O sovereign, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God pays attention to us is the first section of the text. The second one is, and we are made in the image of God to pay attention to God. But here, we are made also to pay attention to the world in God's name. That's what I understand the word dominion actually to mean. It's often taken and been abused, of course, as we all know, and turned into the word domination. Instead of a sense of, of attentive, weighted concern and compassion and engagement and stewardship, all of the, the richer vocabulary that actually describes what our dominion is meant to be. Our power is limited power. We are stewards of a greater power. We're meant to turn to the world around us, our neighbors, but here most specifically, let's say, to the natural world, to actually exercise a stewardship of dominion in creation. We begin this academic year at a time when the, the, the physical world that we know has never been more imperiled by decisions of human beings who have overexerted our humanity or underexerted our humanity. We are human. We are neither more nor less. And our stewardship of the earth needs to be boundaried by a sense of finitude and by generations and by an accountability to a God who has given us charge not to take control and have dom domination over but to exercise a stewardship of servanthood and love and nurture and care for the natural world. We have a little dog in our house, and when our children were younger, I, they, and they were still at home, I would sometimes say at the beginning of the day, so what are we all going to do? And they would each say what they were going to do, and then I would turn to our dog and say, and, and what are you going to do? And our dog always gave the same answer, which was that our dog was just going to be a dog today. And, 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 our and our dog was the only one, one therefore, who was for sure going to fulfill his identity. <laughs> that the rest of us in the family were either going to give more attention to trying to be more than human, or we were going to concave and concede to being less than human. And neither of those two options is the option that we're invited to embrace here. We're invited by the psalmist to embrace our full responsibility as creatures made in the image of God, finite, limited, but profoundly valued and treasured with all human dignity. The responsibility of a seminary like this is to form people who will go out and be agents of formation in the world to enable the people that you touch through counseling or through missions or through some sort of pastoral or theological role to exercising the kind of dominion, the stewardship of the earth that will reflect the glory of God. When, when we, we care, care for our neighbor from the most vulnerable to the most powerful. When, when we care for the earth, again, from the most vulnerable ecologies to the most established. We are attending to the God who has made us, who pays attention to us, and who then says and gives us our charge now today and every day. Attend to the world that's around you in my name. Carry its burdens carry its fears, carry and consider its urgencies, its crises, carry issues of injustice, understand the significance of human suffering, enter as this God does into our humanity and into our suffering in order to enable the world to see that the God who has created two trillion galaxies is a God of intimate personal compassion, justice and mercy who calls us to grow up in Christ. So that the God who pays attention to us and to whom we pay attention is the God who informs and guides and shapes and inspires and leads us as we pay attention to the world that's around us in that God's name. So indeed, O Yahweh, our Adonai, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, by your grace, may we Receive the inspiration of this text. Stretch us in awe. Deepen our understanding of our own and our neighbor's dignity. And call us, O oh God, with eyes and hearts and hands and feet to exercise the kind of dominion that is faithful and humble 
and grounded in an accountability to you, the God of glory and beauty and justice, the God of thriving. May you, O oh Lord, be majestic in all the earth, in our lives, in this year, in Fuller Theological Seminary. Community of saints, beloved of God, we are mere mortals, and yet the creator of the universe spreads the table for us and chooses to dine with all of us. All are welcome here. Staff and administration, you are invited to this table. Faculty, you are invited to this table. All new and returning students and guests, here and online, you are invited to this table. Amen. La noche que Jesús fue entregado, tomó pan, dio gracias, lo partió diciendo, tomad, comed, Este es mi cuerpo, que por ustedes es partido. Hagan esto en memoria de mí. Y después de haber cenado a sí mismo, tomó también la copa y dijo, esta copa es el nuevo pacto en mi sangre. Hagan esto todas las veces en memoria de mí. Cada vez que comamos este pan y bebamos esta copa, la muerte del Señor anunciamos hasta que Él venga. Amen. As we prepare to come before the Lord's table, will you join me in prayer? Our gracious and merciful God, creator and Lord, we stand in awe. You who hold all things together, who has placed all the stars in the sky, you too have placed us here at Fuller. Thank you for being mindful of us. Lord, you have called us here to Fuller to teach, to study, to learn, to minister, to be formed. And we give you thanks for that work. As we begin a new season, a new academic year, we surrender to your spirit and all that your spirit is doing and wants to do here among us. As we walk into a new day, a new year, we surrender our own agendas and open our hands and our hearts to yours. God, we believe you are good and we believe you are loving. And we believe you have invited us together and uniquely to your mission and stewardship in this world. We ask that you would form our hearts and our minds, our bodies and relationships anew for that mission. Transform us, God, into the image and likeness of your Son. Bless us as students, as faculty, as administrators, as staff. Central to our life at Fuller, we celebrate your life, your death, the resurrection of Jesus, whose broken body and shed blood has set us free. We thank you for the spirit of the living God who lives in us, and will sustain us and renew us for this new day. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. Today we pass the elements and bless one another as a community. As you share the bread with your neighbor, say, Body of Christ broken for you. As you hold the cup for your neighbor to dip their bread, say, the blood of Christ shed for you. The elements today are allergy free. Let us share this meal together.
O Yahweh, O Adonai, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Send us, O God, from this place as we study, as we teach, as we meet and discuss, as we love and serve one another. Send us from this place wherever we are, whether we're here physically in Pasadena or someplace around the globe today. May you, O oh God, be the one who is in our mind as the source of all life and the deserver of all awe. May we hold with respect and justice and mercy the weight of one another's lives the significance of how we see and know and engage one another. And, and may we turn out to the world that we are part of and in all the places that we go, through our work and our ministry and our labor and our friendships and everything that we engage, and see the world and hold it as a gift which we are meant to steward. May we be faithful and wise and bold and courageous May we be humble. May you, O oh God, be the source of all glory. May the God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, beyond all that we could ask or even imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.
Hallelujah. You may now go in peace. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for coming today.